Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am your co-host, Jamie Bateman, and I'm joined today by Chris Miles of MoneyRipples.com. Chris, how are you doing? Yeah, just fantastic, Jamie. Nice. Um, so, Chris, for our audience who may be unfamiliar with you, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and uh, give us a little bit of your, your background and what you do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, my background is I, I've basically been in finance for the last 19 years, right? So going on almost 20, um, I started out as that mainstream financial advisor, right? Like the kind of guy you probably rip on on this show, or I hope you do at least. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know I rip on, on my show, you know, so. Um, but yeah, like I started out as that mainstream financial advisor. It wasn't really my path intentionally. I actually wanted to go into business consulting, but I figured if I'm going to go into business consulting, I should have real life business experience, right? So I ended up going with a commission only type of firm uh, where I had to build my own business, you know? And, and when I got that teach that entrepreneur bug taste, I was like, man, I'm hooked. You know, like that's, you know, I always wanted to control my own destiny, my time, my freedom, you know, yeah, the amount yeah. of money I can make and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'll tell you, like after four years of being in the industry, I started to get, uh, uh, what's the word? I guess like my, my testimony of it, right? My my strength and belief in financial advising and financial planning started declining because, okay. you know, as I started to see real life experience, I started to see like people that had advice from the last 20 plus years, right? That had been following financial advisors advice, hadn't really been much better off. And, and as I started to see like behind the curtain more, right? And how I was really just a salesman in a suit, Right. I mean, that's what really financial advisors are. They offer the same old junk. It's mm -hmm. usually either mutual funds or insurance, right? Or annuities, or, which is in between them. Right. So mm -hmm. it's basically those few things. It's like the Mexican food of financial advising. You know, like <laughs> it's got the same ingredients that is called by different names burrito, taco, tostada, fajita. It's all the same <laughs> ingredients. Right. You know, so as a result, like I thought, man, this is hard. But it wasn't until I met someone that was a real estate investor, right? Uh, and actually I, I had known him for a little while, but he left being a financial advisor to do real estate investing. Okay. And he started to learn stuff, including note investing and things like that. He was doing hard money lending. And, mm -hmm. and of course they were, you know, were buying properties. And, and, uh, and I remember we were getting this debate, this is the end of 2005, right? And we got in this debate about what's better, stocks or real estate, right? Mm -hmm. And then he finally just stopped me and he said, Chris, how many of your clients are actually financially free? like where they don't worry about money. And I thought sure. about it, I said, well, none, you know, like even, even the ones that are retired still worry about money. Right. He said, all right, well, good job, Chris, you know, way to go there. Um, how about this question? How many of you guys as financial advisors are financially free, not off the commissions you're earning, but actually doing the investments you've been recommending. Mm -hmm. sure. And I thought, I thought for a little while, I said, well, none, maybe one guy in the office. And I found that that guy wasn't either later on. Right. Mm -hmm. So like none of them had become financially free. Even someone that worked in that industry since the late seventies, you, you think since the late seventies, they'd be able to retire. Yeah. No, they couldn't. They could only retire based on commissions. Right. And, and that was epiphany for me. I said, all right, well, tell me the answer. He's like, I'm not going to tell you the answer. Cause I don't think you were open to it. And I was like, he kind of took it away from me. So I said, give it back, you know, like, right, tell right. me. So you, know, you got me to admit I'm wrong. I'm an idiot. Okay. So what? <laughs> Um, so, uh, I actually ended up, uh, he told me, okay, if you're really serious, read this book, who took my money by Robert Kiyosaki, which says that mutual funds suck. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I just shortened the book for you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, uh, and then listen to this radio show, this AM radio show that was local that a couple of real estate investors were doing. And so I started listening to that show much like when now we days we listen to podcasts. Right. Right. Yep. And, uh, and a few months later, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I got to quit. So I quit that would never go back to financial advising again. I actually, uh, just stayed on the path of being a mortgage broker because I was mortgage licensed. Okay. Uh, so I, I just did that. And I taught ballroom dancing at the local university, you know, okay. so I was basically just doing the things I kind of loved, you know, yeah. and, but the thing is, it drove me nuts that these guys knew something I didn't right about making money. And so eventually I started to learn from them, you know, many, many of the kind of principles you guys are teaching right now. Right. I started learning from them. And, and as a result, I was able to retire later that year in 2006. And, wow. uh, and I was like, holy cow, that was easy. I was 28 years old, you know? So I was like, what am I going to be when I grow up? You know, what am I going <laughs> to do with my life? You know, I didn't yeah. expect to hit freedom. I, I thought I'd have to build up money for decades. So, you know, or hopefully if I was lucky by the time I was 40, save up enough money, like $2 million, be cheap that whole time. So then right. I can live on less than the interest, right? Sure, right, right. That was yeah. my plan. 
and then all of a sudden happen faster, you know? Yeah, I can, uh, I can relate to a lot of, a lot of what you're saying. And I think our audience can as well, just taking, taking ownership and thinking about alternative investments and that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's really cool. Um, so then what happened? Well, uh, I, you know, I tell people I retired twice, right. Okay. Um, and that's not a good thing become financially independent twice, even though it sounds awesome, but it really just means you screwed up the first time. Right? <laughs> right. So, so yeah, 2006, I got out of the rat race, 2007, I decided to come out of the, the retirement mode, you know, and just start teaching people. So I partnered up with some guys and it was right before the recession hit. Um, sure. I thought I had the Midas touch, everything I touched turned to gold. So I started gambling with my real estate and other things. And so I found myself from like millionaire to upside down millionaire, okay. or I was like in the hole, like over one point. Well, I've been in the hole about 16,000 a month between my wow. business and my personal life. Jeez. And so, uh, so what kind of, if you don't mind, what kind of real estate yeah. were, you, were you doing up to that point? Um, mo- mostly like I, I thought I was doing rentals, but really what I was doing is I was buying stuff and I was negative cash flow and properties. Uh-huh. Um, I did some note stuff, but it was yeah. with guys that didn't know what they're doing either. And so, right. you know, basically like everything was going to crap and, on top of that, I cut off streams of income. This was probably the biggest thing is that even though real estate was bad, I could have recovered pretty well from that because I wasn't heavily at risk, you know, as much as I, you know, I could have been. Mm-hmm. But um, the thing is, like, I also cut off streams, this passive streams of income I had to work with that company because his partner said, hey, if we're going to do this, we should be all in. We're in this mission together, you know, you know, all that kind of crap. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so what, kind of, those- what kind of streams of income were those? Uh, there were various, like some of them were business streams of income, some of them were, were investing, but mostly in the business side. So I had like passive, like residual, I call them residual if they're like passive, right? Sure. Um, so distinguish between passive being investments versus residual being business passive, right? Okay. Um, so I had some business passive stuff going on that I generated, you know, mm-hmm. um, various streams of income there. Um, uh, but they're like, Hey, I know you're, do- you've got that stuff going on, but shouldn't you be focused all over here? Mm-hmm. And Right. Which is ironic because we're teaching people how to get out of the rat race. You would think that I should live what I preach and not just, you know, go all in. Like I was a full-time, you know, business owner again. Right. Right. Um, but that's what happened. And so yeah, everything hit the fan, you know, and of course I wasn't tracking money. Well, that was another big issue. I was just, you know, money was so abundant and, and plentiful. I was just spending it however I wanted. So I stopped watching my money and, and that's kind of where it got away from me a little bit more. And, and then of course I had a back pedal and, and it didn't matter if I was debt free because people are like, oh, it's because you're in debt. I'm like, no, even if I was debt free, I was still negative cash flow. Yeah, because that is, I mean, they do say that about the reason most businesses go under, right? Is it's a yeah. cash flow issue. It's not it really is assets, it's cash flow, right? Yep, exactly. So I did avoid bankruptcy. Like I was kind of stubborn there. Um, my credit probably would have had a better time if I went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, but I did pay that stuff back. It took me until, you know, about, you know you know, into 2015 and then 2016, I was able to get out of that rat race again, be financially independent. Um, and then I started teaching people again, how to get out of the rat race. Cause when I was in the rat race, I felt like I couldn't teach it. Mm-hmm. So instead I was teaching people how to be resourceful, how to find the money so they could do things, you know, how to free up cash, invest it or whatever. Right. No, I think that's honorable to be honest is, is, uh, you know, there are so many people out there teaching things they've never actually done themselves <laughs> and, uh, or not doing today, right. Not it's, doing today. Right. They're no longer active in the space, whatever it is. Um, yeah. I, you know, I can tell you how to create a seller finance. No, I used to do this in the eighties and it's like, okay, <laughs> yeah. but well, things, things have changed a little bit. Exactly. Um, so, and plus you've, uh, you've been able to speak to it from, both, I guess, success and failure, which I think, yeah. hurt, you know, you learn more from your failures oftentimes. So that's, that's really sure. interesting. So 2016, that's where you were, you were starting to, you retired again. Yeah. And in 2016, I got to that point and I was like, all right, what am I going to do? And I was working maybe five, 10 hours a week, you know, doing like my podcast and I was consulting a few clients and such. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once again, every time I try to retire, people want me out. Right. You know, and, uh, and naturally, uh, there was a guy who was actually a credit investor. He had a big following of like doctors and dentists and things like that. And he's just like, Chris, like you taught me this whole thing about like how to actually double dip my money and get it to work for me twice. Right. Mm-hmm. He's like, you got to teach my people this. I was like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I like it. You know, I was like, what about the guy I referred you to to do all that work? He's like, well, he's okay, but he's kind of a nerd and he doesn't really talk the language of investors, you know? And so I said, all right, I'll do it if it's no more than five or 10 hours a week. And uh, so I kind of came out of retirement, started doing that in 2017, added that to like the consulting I'm doing to help people get out of the rat race and then the podcast. And 
so now, I mean, things are just blown up, um, but I still try to keep part-time. So I'm probably about 20 hours a week, give or take. Yeah. And you've got um, a pretty big podcast following yourself. Um, yeah. We'll touch on that later. Chris, Chris uh, Seventy and I were just, just on that. Um, yep. But uh, so that's what you're focused on now. Um, it sounds like those, those several, a few different uh, buckets, it sounds like, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's more of my active stuff. The passive stuff I'm doing, like I still got investments and things like that that I have going on, but mm -hmm. Yeah, the active stuff I do with my time, it's like trying to find that balance between this and family and, you know, because my wife likes it when I cook breakfast or whatever, which I skipped this morning. So she's probably not going to like me today. But, uh, you know, but uh, it's, that's the kind of thing is like just trying to create that balance in my life and but do the things that I love. Right. Sure. And then anything I don't love, let somebody else handle that. Oh, I, lo I love that. So so I think uh, so you you do a version of infinite banking. Is that correct? Yeah, I do a version I refer to as max ROI, infinite okay. banking. Okay. Uh, so um, a little bit different than traditional. Yeah, if you don't mind, because we've, we've had uh, some infinite banking guests on our show. I personally practice some level of infinite banking uh, that cool. I, I use, um, you know, whole life insurance, high cash value, whole life insurance that I borrow against for my, for my note business in particular, and also some real estate things. Uh, right. And, you know, that's, people can check that out on, on my website, labradorlending.com. I have articles about that and talked about that on podcasts. So I'm curious, you know, how, uh, how you, you will go, go about that with your own stuff and with clients. Yeah. You know, so it, that's, that's the thing that kind of got me even out more, right? Because uh, like I was trying to get, you know, the, a, a friend of mine that we had kind of developed this thing over together. And let, let me just tell you, like, for those of you, that, I, I'm sure you guys, if you've listened to the show, you already kind of know a basic thing about infinite banking. Um, I was first introduced to it in 2006. So understand that in the early days of my financial advisor days, I was ripping on it. I was like, yeah, you only make one or 2% a year. That's crap. Like go invest in the market. You'll make more money. Right. Um, I was also saying that real estate only made 3% a year, you know, because it you know, goes up with inflation and all that kind of stuff, sure, not sure. understanding cash flow, you know, things like that. So 2006, when I started meeting some of these real estate guys, they were doing the same thing. They were using infant banking, but not like what you are doing or I'm doing. Right. Mm -hmm they were doing the very long version, like the Nelson Nash version, right? Which is you know, the first two years, you have zero cash in it. And then finally year three, you start to have something, right? Mm -hmm. But they're all hyped up on it. I was like, and then they started, and I kind of got the vision of, oh, okay, you can use this as like your own bank. Got it. Well, 2008 rolls around, of course, you know, I'm in the hole, 16,000 a month. I can't afford to pay my premiums. Mm -hmm. Even though I paid about 20, 25 grand into it, I only had a few hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And so- value. In cash value. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So I lost the policy. Wow. Now I asked in the very beginning because I understood insurance because I was insurance licensed and still am right for the last 19 years. And I said, can I overfund this? And the guy's okay. answer was no. If you do, you create a mech. It becomes taxable. Right. Yeah. And I thought, well, okay, fine. Well, let's just do the way you do it then the way you design it. Right. Well, after I lost that policy, because it was like the most expensive crappy term policy I could possibly have, you know, putting 25 grand to then lose it all. Yeah. Um, then I was like, well, that stinks. And so I started to dig in and I realized I could have overfunded it from day one. Mm, wow. And so I actually got numbers together because I was appointed with insurance companies and I, and the guy's like, yeah, but you need the death benefit. Like that's what allows you to spend money while you're alive. You know, all right. that kind of stuff. He's very guardian, you know, company focused, right. Which they're like anti-infinite banking. Right. And so at least the, the better, you know, cash, you know, higher cash version. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, fine. Um, let's do apples, apples. I'll make sure I have the same death benefit as you and all that kind of crap, even though I don't focus on having high death benefit now. Mm -hmm. um, did it and I, and I beat everything of his numbers, right? And, nice. uh, and he kept coming up with objections and I shot him down. For two hours, we debated in his office. And, and I'm like screaming and yelling at him, like seriously, like getting mad. Like everybody outside the office could hear me yelling. And, uh, <laughs> and, and finally, yeah, at the very end, it got down to, Chris, I just can't afford to cut my commissions that way. Wow. And wow. I was like, you will never get a referral from me again. Cause he was the one I was sending all my people to, right. I was like, here, you'd handle it. You deal with that stuff. Right. I'm like, right. I can never do that. And same thing, like in 2016, I had my best friend doing it and he does a great job, but I realized I could do it better. Like, cause he was doing the more, the, the alter, the more the typical infinite banking you see today, which is you might have 60, maybe 70% of your cash value in year one. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but still, like from an investor perspective, it's like this tug of war. You're like, yeah, but I got to give money to here to lose it from over here. Mm -hmm. Well, I found out, I was like, I could do it. I could do over 90%, but I found out that those costs were too high. So I found the one that was the right medium where only about 80, 
you know, per, about 80% goes in, only about 20% comes out in cost versus, you know, 10, mm -hmm. but you have more money long-term too. So gotcha. you have this perfect balance of more money now and later. And the thing that switched to my brain was that double dip effect, right? Because the money inside that policy compounds interest tax-free. Sure. When you borrow it, you're borrowing at simple interest. Right. So when right. you borrow it, especially when you use it for cash flowing purposes, whether it's for notes or you're doing, you know, long-term rentals or right. whatever you're doing, right? You're flowing that money through. Absolutely. So what happens is you're paying that loan and down and down, that interest goes down while your compound goes up. So the cool thing is, is that even if you're earning only about a little over half the interest rate. So even if you you only earn like 4%, but, a loan to, but they loaned it to you at 5%, mm -hmm. you know, that money, yeah. you would still beat it. You would still come up with more interest than you would in having a savings account. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's where it becomes like this tax-free supercharged savings account. And there's a, there's lines of credit you can get right now at three and a quarter or, you know, right around there, like prime or prime minus a half percent. Right. You can do all kinds of cool stuff to get that double dip effect where you make money in two places at the same time. Yeah. And just to jump in, I, I uh, it took me, honestly, I'd heard about infinite banking years ago and, mm -hmm. you know, read up on it. And of course, everything on the internet is, is, is true, right? Uh, yeah. But no, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, unfortunately, infinite banking is extremely controversial. Oh, yeah. And I say, unfortunately, because I just think a lot of people don't understand it, or more importantly, the, the policies are not set up correctly. And that's right. You know, this this episode isn't going to be all about infinite banking. But mm -hmm. um, I found that who you're working with is critical in setting up the policies appropriately that are designed for infinite banking. And yeah. like you like you touched on, it, it was that my uh, mindset had to shift a little bit. And it kind of once I figured out, wait a minute, this, this, is, this policy, the cash value is still growing while mm -hmm. I'm able to borrow against it, arbitrage that money somewhere yeah. else. Um, it really was a no brainer for me to jump in. Um, now, the other thing that people get confused with is, well, I can make more money in the stock market. Or I can make more money in whatever mm -hmm. else it is. Well, to me, it's, right. not, it's not the same. Yeah, they're right. It's not because, yeah. because it's not an investment in and of itself. I, I don't view it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, I will say I've had uh, similar conversations. We, we have some money in stocks. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're, you're introducing a concept to your, your spouse or your, your family, that you're not the only one that makes all the decisions. So you've got to get them on board if that's what you're, you're trying to do. Um, when I had this conversation with my financial advisor at, at Vanguard, um, mm -hmm. she was not happy whatsoever. And oh, yeah. I was already at the point where I was like, look, I'm doing this. So don't push me like, you know, you can, you can keep this amount of money that you have to manage. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But, I, but I'm taking a good chunk and I'm starting, starting this infinite banking thing. So, yeah. um, so then how do you use it today then? Yeah, it is. You're right. It's totally controversial because there's so many different ways that, you know, insurance guys design it so either one of two things happens, right? Either one, they just don't know how to get that max ROI, which is very common because I've helped start, you know, like certain philosophies. If you go online, you find like cash flow banking or wealth formula banking. Mm -hmm. That's stuff that I started, mm -hmm. but then I kept perfecting from there. They got stuck and then I just okay. kept going. Right. And, uh, and so when you see that kind of stuff out there, like they'll say, Hey, you do it this way. But again, like almost every time I see it, insurance guys always come from an insurance salesman perspective. Right. 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 And so, yeah, it's freaking confusing. Plus they tell you things, you know, lies like, Oh, you're paying yourself back. That's bull crap. You are not paying yourself back. You are paying down to a line of credit. Sure. You know, sure. like you're paying to a bank called the insurance company, right? Or even a little bank, you know, if you're leveraging the bank's, you know, ability mm -hmm. to lend on that, right? So you're, you're actually paying interest. But what's different is it's like having a HELOC, but it's like having a HELOC that actually pays you, right? Mm -hmm. It pays you interest too, right. at the same time, which pays you more interest than what you're being charged. That's the that arbitrage you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But again, like, because all these little, lies out there and things like that. And, you know, you get guys that, that with their own self-interest because they're not financially independent, right? Mm -hmm. Then they're like, well, you know, if I just do this, they'll still get a good policy, but then I'll make more too. And so there's sure. self-interest in that battle with yours. Uh, right. And again, they, they just don't, you know, think about using it out there, right? They don't think about using it with investments. And if you do it right, like, like I try to get to where about five years, you break even on the cost. Mm -hmm. Like by the point where you have is just as much in cash as what you put in, so the insurance was basically like it was non-existent. You know, right. the insurance costs were gone by that point. Right. And you're doing that with a uh, probably paid up additions rider and uh -huh. combination of whole life and term potentially. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It's just blending it and doing stuff to lower the cost, 
put, you know, basically get the max amount of cash in with the lowest death benefit and lowest cost possible. Yeah. And right? I, I just love the, I mean, the, the thing is, it's the mindset and it's like, like you yeah. I th- think you're kind of touching on it instead of storing up all this money in your 401k to eventually retire and hope mm-hmm. that you have enough to live off of. You're actually taking control now. And infinite banking is one of those ways that you're doing that. You're taking control so that you can monitor your cash flows, be, be, yeah. take ownership of your financial future. That's, that's what I love. I mean, that's what our audience is all about as well. So that's why uh, I call it anti-financial advising, right? Because yeah, so many times, like you have people saying, Hey, if you do this mutual fund or you do this insurance product, you'll be free. The truth is I ran the numbers, no mutual fund or no insurance product will make you free. Not even whole life will make you free by itself. You have to have alternative investments like notes and other things in real estate or other places or franchises or whatever it might be that will help you get that freedom. And if you use the infinite banking right, it doesn't compete with it. It actually uses that money to flow through to those places and flow back. And you have this constant cycle of money growing mm-hmm. two places at the same time. Absolutely. So speaking of those alternative investments, what are you looking mm-hmm. at either personally or with your clients or, you know, in the next couple of years, I know we don't have, none of us have a, has a crystal ball, but um, yeah. what are you looking to do kind of on the investment side, not so much on the infinite banking side? Yeah. On the investment side, it's fun. Um, I mean, besides, I mean, I mean, like commercial properties, I'm probably holding off on for a little while, right? You sure. know, especially business commercial and things like that. But uh, I think there'll be a day that could be a great investment. Mm-hmm. But right now, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a lot of turnkey still. Like I, I don't like managing my own properties. Like I'm, sure, I'm sure. very passive in how I like to invest. Right. And so um, turnkey is one of my favorites because yeah, can I, you, can you speak to that? I, I can tell you that I I've had, uh, particularly one investor in the last couple, couple weeks asked me, you know, he, he's really not sure what he wants. Do I want to do notes? Do I, what, what do I want to do? You know, do I want to do turnkey? And he's asking me, do, should I do turnkey? Well, why not both? <laughs> well, you can do both. Absolutely. And it's like, <laughs> I need more information. First of all, you know, I'm not yeah. going to tell you what to do. You know, it depends what you like. So what do you, mm-hmm. what do you like about turnkey? Well, the thing I like is that you get cash flow and growth, right? I mean, sure. that's, that's a key because I mean, syndications, like people talk about doing multifamily syndications, which is cool too. I like that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is that's usually more growth focused, not cash flow income focused, right? Right. Where with turnkey, like I usually go for a goal of getting at least a 12% cash on cash return, you know? That's pretty good. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, and it's never in the Western half of the United States, right? Like it's always like looking out East, you know, I just closed on two properties in Alabama recently. They were like, about 82,000 out of pocket with closing costs, but I'm going to cash flow, and pro, you know, net profit about 900 bucks a month after all my expenses, including management, property management fees are paid. Nice. You know, so, those so again, like I, Birmingham again, or where, where are they? Yeah. Uh, near you know, Tuscaloosa was, were these okay. ones. Yeah. So it, not too it. far. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had properties in Memphis, North Carolina. I mean, I go all over the place, but, um, but yeah, I like looking for those kind of properties. Mm-hmm. Um, now granted, here's the hard part. It's trying to scale that. Right. Um, sure. You can to some level, but eventually you're starting looking for like maybe duplex turnkeys or whatever. Because mm-hmm. again, I like to be a hands-off investor. I mean, the hardest work on a turnkey is buying the property. Once yeah. you bought it, it's like watching grass grow. Um, yeah. I'll tell you though, like, you know, give you an example. I mean, the cool thing is beyond the cash flow is that there's growth happening too. You know, I bought a property in Memphis almost exactly just a little under three years ago. And uh, this property now, you know, I was 32,000 out of pocket. It's cash flowing about 390 a month. So it's over that 1% a month rule mm-hmm. for me, right? Um, but what's cool is it's now appreciated like over 30 grand too. Yeah. So it's appreciated over 30 grand. I've actually almost made all my money back in just appreciation alone. Plus they pay down my mortgage for me at about 3,000, 3,500 bucks. Right. Um, and then all the cash flow I've gotten over those the last three years too. Yeah. So when you no, add all that, that together, it's like 130% rate of return in the last three years, right? Plus with um, the tax tax benefits of depreciation and all that. Stuff. Yeah, that, um, I didn't even count that, but that's only tax free <laughs> income, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, people, you know, I think after the crash, two thousand eight, two thousand ten, mm-hmm. people said, you know, stop relying on appreciation. So there's kind of the, the pendulum yeah. kind of swung back to all cash flow, right? Yeah. Um, I think we've kind of come back where you know appreciation is real, right? And it can yeah. be a big factor in your investment success. So I mean, yeah. I think it's hard to predict but it is exactly. an absolutely uh, in critical factor in, in success. Personally, I, I go, like you said, for cash flow first mm-hmm. and then kind of look at markets that likely will appreciate um, and yeah. try to get, you know, both, both wins, if you will. So that's the same way I look at notes, right? Like, because yeah, for me, like I learned from the last recession, right? Is that you definitely want to focus on cash flow, and that should be primary. Um, if you get appreciation, that's just a bonus, right? That's just the icing on the cake. Right. Um, but it's nice. It's, it's yeah. nice because it does happen for the most part. Most, 
I mean, other than the last recession, the last six recessions, real estate only went down then. Like the other recessions right. either stayed the same or even increased in value during a recession. Sure. And uh, so I think that's important to remember that because sometimes it's weird with real estate, we have such a harsh view on it. But the stock market, we have like this, you know, like this Dory from Finding Nemo type memory. It's like, oh, well, yeah, that was then. It goes up, it goes down, you know, like we give this, we give it all that, you know, that uh, leniency. But with sure. real estate, people don't do that, you know, and right. don't realize it's much more stable and steady and certain right. than anything the stock market will ever offer you. No, and the thing with the stock market is there's literally no collateral. I mean, with hmm. with notes, your real estate is your collateral if you're doing mortgage notes. Um, yeah. So even if inherently it's riskier, which I don't believe, uh -huh. uh, you have collateral. So it's like, you know, you, that, that makes it inherently less risky than the stock. That's market. right. So, um, and so where you have control, you have freedom, right? That's absolutely that's what I think is so awesome that you control and name your terms in note investing, you know, right. and you can't do that stock market. You can't say, Hey, pay me this much. Like we're going to say, we don't care about your, you know, a couple hundred or a couple thousand or even a hundred thousand dollars in this company. You mean nothing to us. Right. Right. But with note investing, you control your own destiny. And I'll tell you, you cannot have freedom without control. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of note investing, do you work with note investing clients or do you, have you dabbled in, did you say you've dabbled in notes a little bit yourself or what's a your little bit? I'm, I'm not a genius at any way, shape, form. Like I see, like, like with you guys, I, I have another friend, Eddie Speed. He's like, mm -hmm. Yep. loves note investing and so we just had a, we just interviewed him and in fact that that episode was released uh, yesterday so oh awesome he's, uh, yeah he's uh been doing it a long time and and if you want to learn from somebody who's really big in the owner financing space and uh that's there's not too many people that know more than eddie speed that's for sure yeah he makes my head spin like <laughs> i get like so like excited but then afterwards i'm like Holy crap. I don't think I understood a single thing of how he did just what he did, you know, cause he's, he's very creative. Yeah. Very. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's, I think that's the fun stuff. You don't have to deal with the to tenants, toilets and trash as much. Right. And right. You know, you're, you're dealing with a different space and, you know, even currently I still, I don't do notes where I design them and do all that stuff. Cause again, right. I'm more passive, sure. so, but I'll go into note funds, you know, where yeah. people are doing the note investing and I'll take a return off of that, you know, split the returns that way. So no, that's that's kind of how I invest. And sure. that's how most of my clients will invest too, is usually more passive there. Got it. Okay. And uh, Chris uh, 70 will yell at me if I don't uh, at least plug our, our fund. Uh, since yeah. that was a softball you laid up there for me, but uh, we've got our integrity mortgage <laughs> note fund that is officially opening March 1st. So by the time this comes out, it will be open. And I think a fund awesome. is a great way to go. I mean, as far mm -hmm. as spreading out your risk among uh, many different assets and definitely uh, the critical piece there is is the, the operator um, because you are you are more passive as an investor and you you do have a little bit less control than if you're out there buying your own notes um, yeah but if you're working with somebody who's experienced I think it be, can be an excellent option and that's one thing I just love about notes, real estate, mm -hmm. everything like this is that, you know, there's so many different strategies you can't, you know, yeah. and if you want to buy one or two whole notes or buy some partials or buy some turnkey properties or make, you know, be a, a, a beast in the turnkey mm -hmm. arena, that's fine. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's your world. So um, I love it. So anything else well, you want to add on that? Yeah. I mean, kind of, support your, your little, uh, your plug there, right? Like, you know, I guess that would be my softball pitch. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'll tell you, like, um, you know, when I get clients a lot of times they, they have IRAs and I'm anti IRA and 401ks, you know, at least putting new money in, but how many times we have people that have old money, like old 401ks or things are like, I want to get out of the stock market, especially where it's at an all time high. It's right, overvalued right. by 249% as of the date of this podcast. So, I mean, that means there's like a 60% correction needing to happen still to get it back into balance. Right. Um, that's, that would be drastic for your retirement, but to say, Hey, if I can get out at the market highs, you know, buy, you know, basically buy low, sell high, not the opposite, which, which most people do. Right. right. And then say, Hey, if I get it out, I'd be having a self-directed IRA. Could I put it in the notes? Cause notes may not have the tax advantages of like some real estate strategies, right. but if it's inside of an IRA, you don't have to worry about that. 100%. You know, you can delay that. And that was the thing with a speed, like I'm anti IRA, IRA. And then I'm hearing him say, what they do with Roth IRAs and stuff. I'm like, oh, why would you do that with grandchildren's Roth? That's horrible. And then I'm like, dang, that would actually work. <laughs> like you can yeah. make so much money as an active investor in notes with that too. You know, that strategy, even if you have to wait forever, you know? And so again, I'm more of the retire early type of person. So I'm anti IRA and 401k for that reason. But mm -hmm. 
but if but you're going to go down that path, you may as well go to a self-directed Roth or something exactly. along those lines and, yeah. and get the tax advantages that are not inherent in note investing. Yeah. Um, so, and that's, that's, I do that as well. Um, definitely, uh, definitely a pretty, pretty uh, powerful tool for sure. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so how are things looking for, for the next, uh, I don't know, couple of years as far as your, your business or your, I mean, we've touched on it already, but uh, mm -hmm. your, your investment uh, kind of thesis or your, your business or the uh, economy as a whole, anything you want to touch on there? Yeah, I mean, the thing we got to be, we got to really be prepared and somewhat diversified right now, you know, which I'm like anti-diversification normally, you know, like um, I like, I like to quote Warren Buffett, you know, which is like, uh, well, uh, I guess the better quote, if you want to really be blunt is Mark Cuban's quote about diversification, because Warren Buffett says diversification is the omission of ignorance, right? Mm. Warren, you know, Mark Cuban's paraphrase version of that is diversification is for idiots. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> nice. Um, no, I'm not saying he's the best guy in the world, but, uh, but, you know, but that's, there's some good point to that. Like you want to be focused, especially on your active investing, right? You want to be really focused and just get good there. Sure. But, uh, but I'll tell you, like when, when I'm looking at what's going on, I mean, there's possible, there's possible deflationary pressures right now, right? Mm -hmm. Because all the stimulus money is coming out. People aren't spending it the way that they hoped to it. They want people to buy goods and services, sure. right? But people aren't, they're either storing it out of fear, wondering, Hey, am I going to get laid off, which is not good for the economy. Right. Or they're paying off debt, which is also not good for the economy, believe it or not. Or they're going and propping up Bitcoin on the stock market by throwing and gambling with it, which is what happened in the Great Depression before when they started borrowing money and throwing it in the market, right? Um, that's why banks no longer make it legal to lend money to then throw in the stock market, you know? So um, those kind of things are going on right now, creating massive bubbles. Mm -hmm. And so there could be some temporary deflationary pressure, which could drive rates down, which means cash is king, Right. So holding cash actually is good. Mm -hmm. You know, note investing is actually good because if you have terms, that means whatever you're getting paid increases in value, right? Mm -hmm. So your income actually, the power of your dollar increases in value, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Versus yep. inflation where it's the opposite. Right. Um, and, then, and then of course, uh, you know, but then yeah, I think hyperinflation will eventually follow that too. So there's, you got to have that balance. So I'm looking like gold and silver, putting some more money into that. And we've been buying that when it got a little bit lower here or last year in 2020. And, you know, mm -hmm. and I've been, looking at like land investing and flipping, you know, and seller financing, things like that. And I've been partnering with the guy on that kind of stuff and, you know, look for a good cash flow from that kind of thing, doing seller financing stuff. So I like the way you, you touched on with, with your active investing. Yeah. Get, get good at one thing. I mean, yes, you know, because there are too many people that suffer from shiny object syndrome. And, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. But, but they mean it in an active way. I think that's yeah. a great way to approach it is, you know, actively get really good at one thing spread your risk out a little bit with your passive stuff. And then after you've learned that one thing for three to five years, something like that, then maybe you pivot to something else that you're doing yeah. actively, but you can't do everything all at once um, yeah. in an active way, but that's, that's really good. Um, and it should be something you love besides the money too. It's that's, like, uh, that's true. You gotta have a passion behind it. Otherwise you'll, you'll suck at it. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's one that uh, I don't want to say I go back and forth, but I do think that, you know, it's good to pay attention to where, where the money is as well. And I think eventually you, you know, those two things put it this way, eventually those two forces will kind of line up, whether it's, you, you know, and I think if you're making more money, chances are you might be enjoying it a little bit more than mm -hmm. if you're doing the same thing and not making any money. But, um, but I hundred percent agree. I mean, life's too short to just grind away at something you're not happy at and, you know, Definitely. you're not passionate about. So um, sounds like you're, you're passionate about helping, helping people kind of take control of their financial situation. Um, so real quick, briefly touch on the kind of the avatar, you know, that you work with, who's your typical client yourself? Yeah, my typical client, uh, I mean, it used to be all business owners, but now it's switched where I have more W2 employees that are just like high paid. You could be, you know, IT managers. You get a lot of those guys or pharmacists or doctors and dentists, chiropractors, people like that. Uh, people usually make at least 150, 200,000 a year. They've got cash sitting around just wondering, how do I work with it? How do I deploy it, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do I use this? You know, how do I essentially accelerate to get out of rat race faster? You know, but in a safe way, not in trying to gamble my way there, which is what people do. And then they, they, they really sabotage their own, their own success. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really the kind of person I have. The person that yeah. says, hey, I want to work because I want to, not because I have to, sure, right? Sure. They want to be in that place of freedom where they, they work by choice, not by needing a paycheck. That's a... 
It's a great, uh, great way to go. So um, how about anything interesting you're, you're uh, working on, on, maybe even outside of your, your work? Is any interesting projects or any interesting books you've uh, been reading lately? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I've been semi-retired, right? So it's like I've been trying to stay that way. And so I've been reading more things about creating more leverage within business, you know, okay. so uh, great books in that. Uh, there's books like uh, almost anything by Mike Michalowicz, right? Like Profit First, mm -hmm. The Pumpkin Plan, Clockwork was one I just got finished recently. Um, those are all great books. And Did in fact, you... by the way, The Pumpkin Plan actually helped me get out of the rat race the second time because okay. it got me to really focus on you know, zoning in on what's really going to work. So I, I did read profit first. I, I, uh, the, my hang up was to be honest with you that, so my wife and I had switched over to some more automated budgeting on the personal side. So we've uh -huh. got a whole bunch of accounts and, you know, it's, a, it's a little, it's, it's pretty automated, but it's still, uh, a lot to set up and I oh, just yeah. couldn't get over the hump of, uh, all these accounts and I, you know, that I got to open for, for profit first. I'm sure there's a, a more simplified way of Okay. That's what I did too. I dumbed it down, okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, cause he was saying you have different accounts, but really I only have like two or three different accounts for my business versus key, like, like the, five or six. Right. Right. And then, but the whole, the main takeaway is you're, you're paying yourself first, right? Instead That's of, it. Instead of the way that most business owners approach things where it's like, Oh, well, let's see what's left over for some profit. I mean, reinvest, you know, <laughs> right. which just means you're just spending money in your business. You have no profit. Right. Sure. So yeah, the overall concept is good, but yeah, the, how you apply it just depends on what works best for you. Sure. So yeah, absolutely. Um, the other book that's been really good is I, I did one called Rocket Fuel, okay. which is a great book. Uh, more on if you ever heard like EOS, you know those yeah, kind yeah. of business systems. Mm -hmm. um, really about trying to get that you know that visionary integrated role. Where surprisingly in my business, I'm actually kind of both, and uh, yeah. so I've, I'm like the lone wolf, and uh, so I'm actually right now in the process of trying to find that good number two person that will kind of counterbalance me and, you know, gotcha. be my yin to my yang, so to speak. Right. Yeah. No, it's tough. I mean, as small business owners, we're all working on trying to work on the business, but mm -hmm. there's actually stuff that has to be done at the, at the present time. Right. So you're constantly yeah. working in your business, but so I don't know that that tension ever fully goes away, but um, you got to keep uh, fighting that good fight. So mm -hmm. um, any other books or anything else you want to touch on before we wrap up? Oh well, man, I just mentioned what four, I think. Yeah, so. yeah that was a, that was a good, <laughs> we've got some homework. So, um, for sure. that was really good. So, well, Chris, this has been awesome. Um, where can people uh, find out more about you or reach out to you? Yeah, you can follow my podcast like the one you were just on, right? You can follow, uh, uh my podcast, the Chris miles money show. You can follow that. Um, or you can even go to my website, moneyripples.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Chris. This has been great. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure, man. Everybody out there, go out and do some good deeds. Take care, everyone.